Carl Donitz's first thoughts about the coordinated use of U-boats goes back to World War I. During that war, U-boats operated and attacked alone at sea. He had been thinking about how much more effective the U-boats could be if they attacked in force and in a coordinated fashion, but how would one do that? He was ahead of his time in his thinking, but eventually radio would provide the answer to that question of command and control at sea. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. Today, we have a briefing on Huffduff, the Allied radio direction finding system that was crucial to the effort to combat U-boats in the North Atlantic in World War II. During World War II, of the 301 U-boats sunk by Allied ships, or ships and aircraft in combined ops, which is different than aircraft alone, it is estimated that Huffduff played an integral role in 24% of those sinkings accounting for 72 U-boats out of a total of 765 lost in total. Huffduff was one of several technologies that, by itself, didn't decide the course of the Battle of the Atlantic, but it did play a significant role. In addition to Huffduff, U-boats had to deal with sonar, ship and airborne radar, aircraft with sonobuoys and Fido, Bletchley Park, and last, but certainly not least, the U.S. Navy itself. It was all these factors added together that spelled eventual defeat for the submarine-focused naval strategy of the Kriegsmarine. Let's be clear about something. The Kriegsmarine used radio a lot in the Battle of the Atlantic, far too much communication between the U-boats and BDU, and they got sloppy with it, probably a combination of hubris and just operating inexperience. The Kriegsmarine knew the Allies could locate their submarines at sea, but it's unclear if they ever specifically knew of the existence of Huffduff itself. They believed it was done by land-based radio direction finding stations and or ship and airborne radar. This was in direct conflict with what U-boat captains observed and experienced at sea, and what B. Deanst learned from their intelligence work. I have references and relevant links in the description to this briefing. Uh, There are also some links to other YouTube channels where you can see demonstrations of the American Huffduff system, a portable German direction finding set, and the German courier system. I also have a few tie-ins with World Warships. If you have any questions or comments, please post them below in the comments section. Okay, let's do a one-slide review of high-frequency radio theory. Uh, If we are transmitting in the high frequency portion of the radio spectrum, which is 3 to 30 megahertz, our transmitted radio signal has a sky wave component, a ground wave component, and there is usually some kind of distance gap from where that ground wave ends and the first reflected radio signal hits the earth, the skip zone, where no one should be able to hear our transmission. The table there gives us estimates on the distance of ground waves for some common HF bands. These are, our, these are distances under ideal situations. Uh, A trained radio operator back in that day could listen to a signal and determine if it was a ground wave or a sky wave based on the quality of the signal. I've experienced this myself in my amateur radio operations, and the difference is very distinct. And uh, one slide to talk about radios themselves. Uh, Let's see here real quick the types of radio transmitters that were being used on U-boats and a comparison to what U.S. fleet boats used. On the U-boat side, we have a primary HF transmitter at 200 watts covering the 80 to 20 meter bands. Uh, There is also a medium frequency, low frequency transmitter, which a U-boat would use as a beacon while trailing a convoy so other U-boats could intercept. The VHF transmitter is really low power and was probably used at sea during underway replenishment. The, uh, The fleet boat side carries similar equipment One interesting thing is the fleet boat VHF set. It covers a different set of bands in the VF range uh, than the German equivalent. And this would have been used to talk to aircraft, which would have been handy for lifeguard duty. So that U-boat primary transmitter covered the range of 3.37 to 15 megahertz. The total available bandwidth is about 11.6 megahertz, which is just 15 minus 3.37. If a Morse code signal uses 150 hertz of bandwidth, that means there's a total of 77,000 possible spots, or channels you could say, where a U-boat could be transmitting. 
that's pretty daunting if you have a manual if you have to manually scan that range of frequencies for a very faint signal that may only last 20 seconds here's the thing though depending on the time of day only certain portions of that hf range would be viable for use because of things like atmospheric conditions and you would know that from your own experience operating an hf radio at sea there would also be portions of that spectrum you would avoid because maybe those were allocated to say commercial broadcasting so you probably only had to manually scan a portion of that radio spectrum cutting down your work significantly and here's another thing you didn't even have to scan 50 percent or 25 percent of that spectrum because the allies knew from operating experience and bletchley park that the german radio net control stations usually only used a handful of frequencies with the u-boats all right, one more history refresher. Uh, around 1887, Heinrich Hertz proved James Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and demonstrated the first application of a radio wave generator, transmitter, and antenna, receiver. This becomes the foundation for the innovation of uh, radio, as we know it today, uh, by Marconi. So in the very early days of radio, we had a way to transmit a signal and to listen to it, but we didn't know where the signal was coming from. Hertz discovered in 1888 the directionality of an open loop of wire used as an antenna. When the antenna was aligned so it pointed at the signal, it produced maximum gain. It produced zero signal when face on. There is a direction ambiguity with this method as the same signal output is achieved if the signal is 180 degrees from the receiving antenna. So it could be either in front of you or behind you. This is a schematic of a typical loop antenna from World War II. These types of rotatable loop antennas begin to see service in the early 1900s. The antenna is located on the exterior of the ship, close to the radio room, because the loop antenna is mechanically connected to a handle which is turned by the radio operator from the radio room. The radio operator turns the handle, which rotates the antenna until the operator detects one of two signal conditions, which is illustrated in this next slide. The operator was looking for a null signal condition, which would indicate the loop was facing the signal and perpendicular to it. The operator would have some kind of scale or compass rose to check the antenna orientation, then he could inform the CIC of the contact. There were some disadvantages to loop antennas. The operator has to know, or find by hand, the frequency of interest with a traditional radio tuner. The operator then manually sets the frequency for the loop antenna, rotates the loop by hand, fine-tuning until it hits that signal null. Manually tuning can take a minute or longer, enough time to miss a U-boat's radio transmission, which could be 20 seconds or less with the U-boat Kurtz signals, which was the uh, short message system. The direction of the single has to be determined because it can be 180 degrees off. Uh, and the loop accuracy is affected by the size of the loop and the distance to the single, along with atmospheric effects on sky waves. Um, this is referring to the horizontal polarization signal contamination. Okay, in the next series of slides, we're just going to show you some examples of loop antennas. We'll start here with uh, a picture from the U-67. Uh, and then we will go to World of Warships, the U-69, where the loop antenna is prominently displayed. And then finally, the USS Cod. Um, you said really tiny up there uh, above the sail with all the other stuff sticking out up there. Uh, but you can see from the from the from the blow up uh, that the loop antenna is definitely there. Let's look at a different direction finding system. British engineer Frank Adcock developed something called the Adcock Aerial in 1916 and patented the design in 1919. The Adcock antenna is an antenna array consisting of two pairs of equidistant vertical elements which can transmit or receive directional radio waves. The antenna pairs don't move, they're fixed in place. Instead of rotating antennas, electrical signals from the antenna pairs are received at a central location where a uh, goniometer is used to determine the direction of the signal. And a goniometer is a device used to find angles. Symmetrical vertical antenna pairs eliminate that atmospheric interference 
that horizontal polarization that affects loop antennas, making the Adcock antenna superior for radio direction finding. By the early 1930s, Adcock antenna arrays are used in large numbers for shore-based radio direction finding and aerial navigation. Some disadvantages of Adcock antennas. The size of the array limits their use to land-based installation. Operators still mainly tune in signals of interest. Uh, inaccuracy still increases with distance to the signal. And even though the shape of the, of, the, of the antenna array eliminates atmospheric interference, reflected sky waves return to the Earth at different angles, affecting the accuracy of signal bearings. So how can we improve on loops and adcocks? Well, a bellini tosi direction finder, BT or BTDF, is a type of radio direction finder invented by uh, Ettore Benelli and Alessandro Tosi, two Italian military officers in the early 1900s. In 1912, they sold their patent for the system to Marconi. This type of RDF system combined features of loops and adcock antennas. There are two fixed, non-rotating loops set at right angles to each other. These loops can be circular, square, or diamond-shaped. The electrical signals from the antenna pair are carried from the antenna assembly through wires to a remote location on the ship for analysis and tracking. This made it possible for the antenna assembly to be placed high up on the ship and away from the ship's superstructure to minimize signal interference. The operating principle is the same for a loop antenna. An operator is going to have to find the signal first, then tune the BTDF by rotating a knob or handle until the desired tone is heard or absence of tone. And the signal bearing would then be read from a compass row mounted on a control panel. So this is the start of Huff Duff, and the BTDF system was used for the British FH1 and FH3 RDF sets. This picture here is from World of Warships from uh, HMS Emerald. And you can clearly see the Bellini Tosi uh, loop antenna uh, in front of the bridge. The FH1 system begins being deployed in March of 1991 and the FH3 system in July of 1941, with widespread deployment of these systems by January 1942. This is the FH4 RDF set that the British began to deploy in October of 1941, with widespread deployment by March 1942. This was the suite setup. This system incorporates a motor-driven frequency scanning system that could stop on a frequency of interest and send the output to an oscilloscope for an instant visual bearing. Not a perfect system, uh, but once a frequency was identified, the operator had to make a manual adjustment to the system based on a calibration card for the frequency and this was done to account for magnetic interference from the ship itself. But still, a well-trained operating crew could get a bearing solution fast enough to catch U-boats using uh, Kurtz signals. And another improvement with this FH4 uh, Huff Duff set was in addition to the two uh, perpendicular uh, loops, it also had a vertical antenna element that could eliminate that uh, signal bearing ambiguity at either being front or back. And here we have a picture. Uh, this is also this is the HMS Daring. This is also from World of Warships, but you can very clearly see at top the antenna array for that HF4 Huff Duff system. So, how exactly did the Allies employ Huff Duff? Well, um, you would have a convoy with at least two escorts that carried Huff Duff sets. Preferably, one of the ships would have the FH4 system. That ship with the FH-4 system would be responsible for monitoring likely frequencies used by U-boats. When a signal was picked up, the FH-4 operator would have to determine if it was a ground or sky wave. If it was a ground wave, you knew the U-boat was close, which could be something like 15 nautical miles away. You'd then contact the other Huff Duff escorts in the convoy with the frequency and bearing you obtained so they could triangulate the contact with their own Huff Duff sets. Once that was done, escorts could be dispatched to track down the contact. And this is mostly happening at night, so you're putting a lot of faith into electronic systems to make up for your lack of human vision. But it did work. Okay, and then we have a picture here. Uh, this is actually the American, uh, one version of the American Huff Duff system. This is the DAQ, DAQ uh, Huff Duff uh, 
panel set. But you can clearly see this oscilloscope in the ROP operator listening and being prepared to you know make the adjustment the calibration adjustment he needs to there would actually be a team of three guys operating this um so it was likely one guy listening one guy maybe making adjustments and maybe the third guy even like uh responsible for select for selecting the proper calibration card and making sure it was ready um now earlier i said that it's unclear the germans knew specifically about huff duff but they themselves were using systems very similar uh this fu NPE uh, A slash C RDF system is basically a Bellini Tosi system. And there's a really good link uh, to a Norwegian amateur radio operator who does a little World War II reenactment using this system to direction find a rogue signal. So the Germans were aware of these types of systems and even used them themselves. So we have to believe at some point they came to the conclusion that the Allies must be using something like this with improvements that made it very fast at direction finding. So this is why Germany began development of the courier system, um, which could be its own probably half hour briefing. So I'm just going to read a little excerpt from Wikipedia here. There's very, not very much information available on the internet about this system. So you kind of got to take what you can find. Um, but uh, courier was a burst transmission system for communication that first began development uh, by Germany in early 1943 eventually being deployed on the Type 21 submarine. Courier was developed to dramatically reduce message transmission times from a typical 20 seconds to about 250 milliseconds and never longer than 450 milliseconds, which is just under half a second. This would have rendered Huff Duff useless. And fortunately, or unfortunately, the war ended before Courier could see action. So that's it for today. It's a big subject I've tried to distill down. Hopefully you enjoyed it and got something from it. If you have any questions, post them below. And until next time, peace out.